I'm Jason Bradford. I'm Cher Miller. And I'm Rob Dietz. Welcome to Crazy Town, where the theme of the high school prom this year is party like there's no tomorrow, because there isn't one. Hi, this is Crazy Town producer Melody Allison. Thanks for listening. Here in Season 5, we're exploring false prophets and the dangerous messages they're so intent on spreading. If you like what you're hearing, please let some friends know about this episode or the podcast in general. Quick warning, sometimes this podcast uses swear words. Language! Now, on to the show. Guys, is it possible I can get some help from y'all? Of Depends. course. Are we talking about lifting something, moving something? No, I want to use your minds, not oh. your bodies. Oh. Well, okay. uh, we're, we're Never geniuses, uh, you know, <laughs> self-proclaimed. So, yeah, yeah. What, what do you need? Well, you know, I wrote A Future is Rural, published by Post Carbon Institute. You, Excellent report. I you, edited that puppy. Super helpful Shameless with that. Shameless plug, guys. Super helpful with that, okay. right? Thank you. Uh, <laughs> but anyway, I got asked to give a talk, and, I, and when I give these talks about it, kind of worry I'm going to come off a little harsh because I basically say stuff like, you know, cities are unsustainable. We're going to have a population shift maybe back to rural areas over the course of the century. That's you a, getting your degree in like urban sports planning. marketing yeah, or right. something? Yeah, right. Like, yeah. yeah. Well, I, I do think you you possibly have that chance of, of depressing some students, right? Because yeah. you're telling them, uh, grab a pitchfork, kid. You're you're going to be shoveling uh, manure. cow manure the rest of your life. Basically, that's what I. Yeah, yeah. That's, yeah. The, yeah. that's that's the takeaway message. Yeah. Well, that I could see that being a little depressing. So you're you're looking for help from us on this. Right. Well, I can give you some help right off the bat because okay. uh, I'm not going to tell you how to give the talk or how to be less depressing. I'm just going to tell you that you're not anywhere close to depressing. Really? Yeah. So yeah. Uh, I got to. Kill- Jason's never had that before. Thank Anyone you. say this that nice. before? Okay. Yeah, you you are like a, a shining beacon of positivity compared it just to just radiates off of you. Yeah, uh, yeah. You're like the sunshine compared to the black hole that once visited my community to give a talk. Okay, you're talking about the like, Coho in Corvallis. Yeah. So yeah. this was when I lived at the uh, co-housing eco village, and we had just been formed. Right. So this is like ten years ago or more. Sure. The speaker came. And basically, he goes on for an hour telling us how we're all going to die. Uh, you know, climate change is in an irreversible feedback loop, and everything's going to be gone. Now, see, this is this is kind of nuts because the the eco village is is a bunch of sustainability minded yeah, people. Yeah, they're aware of our problems. Community people trying to figure out like. How do we live in this world in a way with a smaller footprint? Yeah. How do we build community oh, so yeah. that we're resilient against the you know the likely we're problems? Doing, doing that are, all that the right coming. things, Rob. Yeah, we we even had this group called Resilience Network. The Resilience yeah. Net. I know. I, 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 yeah, unbelievable. And then this guy comes in. He says, "That's all pointless. Why would you do that? We're all gonna die soon." Uh, yeah. So so uh, this guy, funny enough, is named Guy. Guy McPherson. Ah, yes. And I think, Jason, you, you you just don't have to worry. You just have to put your talk next to a Guy McPherson talk. Yeah. And, and I mean, fine. I'm not telling you you're going to die. I'm just telling you you got to grow potatoes. Yeah. Well, if you want to live. So, Rob, explain who this McPherson guy is. Yeah. So, he got a PhD in range science from Texas Tech University back in 1987. And he had this career as a professor at the University of Arizona. He's in the School of Renewable Natural Resources, where he focused on the conservation of biological diversity. I love okay. that. So, cool. yeah, kind of up our alley, right? Yeah. He goes to emeritus status in the year 2009, but he's written over 100 articles. 10 books. One is called Walking Away from Empire. Another is called Going Dark, kind of about energy issues. And I I don't know, the titles kind of seem up our alley as well. Mm -hmm. Uh, But then he he starts writing this blog called Nature Bats Last. And he ended up traveling all over the place, giving talks based on these writings. That's how I ended up seeing him. And then he also publishes a lot of videos on YouTube, of course, as you do. Uh Uh-huh. Yes. So, I've I've actually interacted with Guy, too. I've met Guy. And his shtick was very similar when I saw him to when you saw him. And it's basically, you know, for the past 20 years, he's been in the business of telling people we're going to die, like, if not tomorrow, you know... Virtually tomorrow. For pretty soon. Pretty I, soon. I got to say, when I, when I heard him speak, I, I was kind of like, I left there and I was like, 
okay, what do I do now? You know, like, yeah. You said we're going to die soon. Uh, do don't I just... even write a will because it's not just you that's going to die. Right. Everyone you would want to give anything so, to will be dead as yeah, well. Don't, don't just dig one grave. Dig yeah. a bunch of Start graves. Start digging graves. <laughs> well, I got to say, I mean, I... I... I, I find him a, a, a frustrating figure, which we're obviously going to get into. There's a reason we we picked the guy for for this season on False Prophets, but you know, frustrating because he's been sounding the alarm about about two crises in particular that are very near and dear to our hearts. The stuff that we talk about, the stuff that Post Government Institute focuses on, and that's mm-hmm. peak oil and climate change. And it was through the concern about those issues that we got to know Guy. Probably all you know, all of us had interactions with him, and we actually used to publish him pretty regularly at, at our website, Resilience.org, back in, I think we stopped back in around 2011, even though he's still publishing stuff yeah. you know, today. Okay, well, let's start talking about you know, some, of the, some of the things that he, he sort of uses as the reason why we're all, we're all doomed. And the one, one is peak oil. So that's a, a quick definition. You can talk about peak of a region, let's say, or you know, what most people talk about when they mean that is the world as a whole, reaches a maximum in the, in the rate of, of extraction of oil. And the concern was that economic chaos may ensue following this peak because oil is the most important input to the, to the global economy. And if that extraction can't expand, the economy will suffer, you know, contract, and there'll be high and volatile prices of everything. Yeah, in the peak oil community, which we were active parts of, I would say had its probably heyday, you know, in the 2000s, right? Yeah. Leading up to 2008. And and McPherson was one of these guys who not only saw that it was imminent, but also saw that or believed that it was would be immediately catastrophic when right. we actually hit that point of sort of peak production. Well, yeah, let's check in with, with McPherson on this, this topic. He gave a talk and Jason you know you're worried about depressing students right uh, yes I want you know, to obviously that. McPherson is less worried oh. let's let's give a little evidence <laughs> of that so this uh, I'm, I'm gonna share with you some stuff that he went over in a talk it was a keynote address that he gave to public health students in a like the master's program at the University of Arizona back in 2007 mm-hmm. okay so yeah I'm just trying to imagine this group of people crowding into this like yeah. uh this hall, college auditorium, you know, whatever, they're yeah. all masters of public health or yeah. they want to heal people. Oh, do gooders. Yeah. 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 My wife has an, has a master's in public health. Right. You know, she's wonderful. Yeah, so here he is in 2007. He warned of the collapse of the U S economy within a decade. I bet you, in- I, I gotta say he, for about a year, a couple of years there, He's people looking- were like, dude, this dude was right. Yeah. Cause right. right at the end of 2007 into 2008, we actually, yeah. Skyrocketing oil prices, financial meltdown. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's what I was thinking. Maybe, maybe he's, he's a soothsayer, yeah. yeah. But then with that economic collapse, he predicted unemployment approaching 100%. <laughs> no jobs. That's only because he couldn't go as high as 200%. And, and, 100%. Yeah, 100%. Okay. Total unemployment uh-huh. and inflation running at 1,000% per year. Okay, cool. Then he said this. He said, by 2012... The world's cities will experience permanent blackouts, starting a transition first to a new dark age, and then over time to a new stone age. Okay, I in 2012, I sat in that movie. 2012. Theater, to see the movie 2012. <laughs> oh, yeah. 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 Yeah, about the... Uh, that was a documentary about what... what <laughs> well, that's the problem. Guy, Guy McPherson, McPherson was he talking thought about. it was a documentary, and they just oh. reported what happened in the film. <laughs> yeah. Roland Emmerich, by the way, is like Hollywood's version of Guy McPherson. Yeah. He makes nothing but disaster movies. But right? disaster movies where humans are possibly going to go extinct. Yeah, it does. It, it comes from all different sources. It yeah. could be a giant lizard like Godzilla. Yeah, great could one. be aliens like Independence Day. Saw that. Could be uh, weather and roaming packs of wolves like the day after tomorrow. I've seen all those movies. Yeah. Right. Well, you know, McPherson, he's got two, right? So one one is the the beast of peak world, the other is the beast of climate change. You know? yeah. But but here's my favorite thing from that that talk that he gave. He said that with this combination of peak oil and climate change, within a century or two, humanity will consist of quote a few thousand hardy scavengers living near the poles <laughs> with the elves uh, up in Santa Claus's workshop. I, I presume. Wait, yeah. wait, hold on a second. There are no poles. I mean, there are magnetic poles, probably, but there's no. Well, Antarctica so. has land, but yeah, up yeah. in the Arctic, there's just it'll be open ocean. Yeah. So. <laughs> okay, so 
the the general term for what his point of view is what's called near term extinction and often it's you know you might have the word climate because of climate so near term climate extinction but really it could be for you know various reasons of of catastrophes of resources and 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 environmental breakdown so he's he's warning about both about these resource issues with peak oil climate risks and you know he really went into overdrive on the climate side of things when when the peak oil narrative didn't quite Gosh, play out. He could do that even with oil depleting. He <laughs> yeah. could go into overdrive. Well, there was, yeah, there was still plenty of oil. We had fracking and stuff, <laughs> so you could overdrive. Nice. Uh, yeah. So he's a, le- you know, a leading voice of the near-term extinction movement, so to speak. And a lot of this is about the runaway feedback loops in the climate system, sudden collapse of industrial activity, like nuclear power plants going haywire and blowing up everywhere, it, it would lead to humanity going extinct in very short order. Well, and if you really want the synopsis, I, I shudder to call it that, but he, he started publishing a, an untitled blog post that's all about this near-term extinction. It's available on his Nature Bats Last blog. Uh, I don't know when he started writing it, but the first thing it says on there is, updated most recently, likely for the last time, or for the final time, to August 2016. I assume he thought he would be extinct (laughs) by uh, by 2017 and wouldn't be able to update it, but uh, I don't know. I I copied that blog over to Microsoft Word, Okay, and just so I could see how many (laughs) words it was. It was 94 pages long and more than 32,000 words. So this was just a running thing that he was adding to over time? Yeah, I kept updating it with with, uh, sentence after sentence, paragraph after paragraph, citing... And Even linking, page by page. Page by page. <laughs> uh, multiple page by... Yeah, whatever. Uh, just journal chapter articles. Chapter by chapter. <laughs> Verse by... Okay, we're okay. going to quit now. Okay. Uh, opinion pieces, news stories, other blog posts, all in service of that main point that climate Armageddon is upon us and humanity is on the precipice of extinction. And uh, look, there are, uh, there are a lot of people who've come to be convinced by his arguments. Mm-hmm. And there's probably a... Sp- You know, when you think about near-term extinction, right, there's probably a spectrum of beliefs out there. We're going to get into some of of Guy McPherson's specific predictions later. Mm -hmm. Oh, we're going to get into them really shortly. But (laughs) We don't have much time. We got to get on this. There, I would say, look, (laughs) when you look at the ecosystem of people that are concerned about the climate crisis, right, you've got on one end, obviously, the climate deniers, and then you've got people who are, you know, gradually maybe more and more concerned about the crisis. The near-term extinction people are basically at the furthest end in terms of what they anticipate is going to happen. And, you know, I think one of the key things here is basically an argument that there's nothing we could do effectively. So people who've come to this conclusion, whether they've been convinced by Guy McPherson or otherwise, there have been support groups, I guess, that have been formed or kind of communities of people who are are sharing this perception with one another. Facebook has a a near-term extinction support group which has several thousand members in Mm -hmm. it. Yeah, the motto is dig my grave and I'll dig yours. (laughs) Does that work? <laughs> I don't know. Uh, I mean, if you do ahead of time. I mean, if you do ahead of time. Well, yeah. look, you, you mentioned his predictions, and I'm not waiting around. We, we got to jump yeah, on Yeah, we got to do this fast. We got to have some fun. Well, because we're going to run out of time. Yeah, I know. No, no, okay. we don't yeah. Have, yeah, we got to hurry we don't up. Have time. I, I call this the happy fun list, okay? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go two of these, uh, Jason, and why don't you read yeah. two of these and a share. You, you got the next two. So this, okay. is just a, this is just a snapshot. Oh, just it's tiny, a tiny, yeah, tiny it's snap. Sample. It's like a yeah. poo-poo platter of them, right? <laughs> so, and we're going to go chronologically here. So in 2007, McPherson predicted the USA's trucking industry would collapse by 2012 due to peak oil, quickly followed by the interstate highway How'd system. How'd you get here today, Rob? Uh, I, I flew in my flying car. Yeah, <laughs> no, the highway wasn't there anymore, so how was I going to do it? Yeah. Uh, in 2008, he predicted the end of civilization by 2018 due to peak oil. If you're alive in a decade, it will be because you've figured out how to forage locally. It sounds a lot like what I talk about sometimes, but yeah. I don't say it like that. I just say over time, slowly, we may have I, to adapt to more local. And food it's not just foraging. No, right? not just foraging. I was out yeah. trying to get acorns from under your tree here yeah. when I got here. Yeah. Oh. Okay. In 2012, my favorite year because the movie was awesome. <laughs> he predicted that global warming will kill much of humanity by 2020. Hmm. And <sighs> in 2016, 
he predicted that humanity and most life forms will be extinct due to global warming by mid-2026. Now, I love it. It's like mid. mid. He's getting exact. Yeah, but see, now <laughs> it's, May 13th. It's kind of a – I mean, given his track record, we better be scared for 2026 because yeah. he just nails it every time. <laughs> okay. Um. I feel like a total asshole for making fun of this dude. But then again, you you read some of these things and they're just really breathtaking. Like this yeah. one. Okay, keep, keep going. <laughs> In 2017, he predicted that global temperatures would be 6 degrees Celsius above baseline in mid-2018. <laughs> oh, my God. So we're talking about like at the most 18 months. Right. 6 degrees C above baseline. We're about 1 degree yeah. right now. 1.2 maybe, yeah. okay? And that the Earth would have no atmosphere I, by 2050. So, we, you know, time will tell on I mean, that right. one. Even but. Venus has an atmosphere, right? <laughs> yeah. I mean, well, we'll have no atmosphere. I don't understand how that works. Yeah, I, I exactly. don't know either. But, yeah. And then June 2018, he implied that industrial civilization was about to collapse in September 2018. So it's yeah. like, not only is he getting more and more exact, but the timeline right. between... His point of prediction and and the thing he's predicting, they're, they're shrinking. Like, yeah, they're shrinking. So industrial civilization was about to collapse in three months, followed by a degree C immediate additional temperature jump to, due to the end of the aerosol production, which actually yeah. might – I don't know if it would be a full one degree. It, I think it, it was a half a degree, degree yeah. when, when we shut down all the planes for September 11th. So right. maybe he's not wrong about that one. Yeah. Um, and anyways, that would rapidly somehow end all complex multicellular organisms on Earth. I mean, the uh, you know, the deep sea organisms, I think, would take a while to... to not according to him. Okay. Okay. <laughs> well, he's still doing this, right? It's not like only 2007 to 2018. We just found a video of him being interviewed by a, an outfit called Biz News TV, and with the Z, of course. Yeah, of yeah. course. It's, it's a pretty news. bizarre interview. But they spelled the news with an S, so it's oh, it's good a for them. it's a combo. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> but so the, the interviewer says to McPherson, in 2012, you predicted the likely extinction of humanity by 2030. In 2018, you adjusted it and said that it would be by 2026. He's he's making it sooner. Mm-hmm. And it's highly unlikely that humans will still be on planet Earth. And of course, uh, McPherson's obvious response to that is, well, I I published two papers and they were peer reviewed. So, uh, and I had co-authors. So with the peer review and the co-authors, you know, that's a conservative estimate. Uh, Oh, so it could happen sooner than three years from now. Uh, This was an astonishing interview. It was a little bit painful. I didn't watch everything because it's a little long, but I watched snippets and it's hard to watch, but there there was a favorite part of mine. It's (laughs) simple. It's in this section because he tries to, he tries to explain to the, to the poor reporter. It is bizarre, bizarre interview. Yeah. Her, her facial expressions. I feel sorry for her having to do this. I don't know. She was like, I I was kind of laughing because she was like, Trying to, I, I don't know, like her mind was kind of exploding in a way. Like, what, yeah, I don't know. What is I haven't seen her other interviews, but this yeah. was weird. Okay. Yeah. Anyway, he he basically tries to explain to her, like, let me tell you the story about the San Benedicto rock wren, and the, the basically the story is that there's this wren, this rock wren. It's a subspecies of rock wren, beautiful birds that uh, I've seen them in like this desert southwest, but this is in Mexico and this island off the coast of Mexico, a few hundred miles off the coast of Mexico in the Pacific Ocean. And it's volcanic and the whole thing explodes and there's like covered by feet of ash and the the little birdie goes extinct pretty quickly probably. And he basically says, you know, that that the rock wren can fly, but we can't fly. (laughs) And it would be basically hubris to imagine that we could survive where this wren could not. Right. He actually said the wren's better adapted yes. than, than than we are as humans. I, I'm just like, how do you make this like little tiny population on this tiny island that it freaking explodes well, and make an analogy to like 8 billion people spread around the planet? It, I was like, what it is has this? wings, Jason. <laughs> wing. You're a biologist. You should get this. We do not have wings. And 
we don't have the peer review <laughs> that McPherson has. So uh, maybe I'll, we just need to shut up. We and just need watch eight, some more videos. Eight billion cans of, of Red Bull because then we will have wings. Oh, yes, way to way to bring in one of our non-sponsors. That's one of our sponsors for today's we, podcast. You wish. <laughs> They were so clamoring to sponsor the yeah. podcast they, about they, Guy McPherson. They oh. didn't because we're he beating said, off all the sponsors. No, they, he said we don't have wings. They're never going to sponsor him. <laughs> That's true. Okay, so here we are. I guess mocking this guy. We're for pretty. This, much, I mean, we kind of laid these, into him pretty hard. These, we try to be nicer than our guests, but, but this one we're not. He, he's I, not a guest. Okay, sorry. <laughs> our targets are. I don't know. We, we couldn't get here. The highway doesn't work. Try to be so. nicer to our punching bags. Is <laughs> yeah. that what you're trying to say? Look, we're going to get into why why it's important to even talk about a guy McPherson. This is not just like uh, punching down on an easy target. No. Although he makes it kind of easy on himself, i got to be honest. Part of it is, for me, just thinking about him, is like is just the frustration of not only is is he talking about issues that are very real concerns. Yeah. They're, they're core things that we, the three of us, obviously care deeply about yeah. post carbon Institute, the organization with which we're all involved obviously is, is really dedicated to, to trying to address. So real issues, not only is he like talking about these in a way that's highly problematic, right? But, you know, he also puts out good observations in some cases. Sure. He's, he's saying things that, that we would, Largely, agree with yeah. it's just wrapped in a cocoon of bullshit that is <laughs> I, I don't know but so like an example right he you know he's talked about the moment that ronald reagan basically pulled the solar panels off of the white house which right. is obviously a very symbolic emblematic yes. moment right yeah. of what a jackass right? at, yeah. at a time when we could have had real progress too you yeah. know this is a right at like 1980 mm-hmm. yeah uh, with with a We're lot coming more out of time. all these oil shocks and you know like yeah, yeah. i mean it was uh whatever so yeah, yeah. You know, he's brought that up he, he talks about the choices that we make every day choosing dams over salmon oil over whales cars over polar bears death over life he talks a lot about politicians and CEOs and and the kind of pathology of, of them. He offers good ideas for taking action. Yeah, yeah. One of the reasons I'm so ready to make fun is because I'm, I'm pretty angry and frustrated because he, he actually had some good ideas to take action, but it's all wrapped in a message of, well, we're going extinct in three years' time. So, I mean, like w- one... Really good idea that he's promoted is stop fixating on cars. Yeah. And I mean, the speech to the public health students had a whole list, a great list of like, you know, the 10 wonderful things we could be, we could do. And it included stuff like produce food differently, you know, moving away from industrial agriculture and, and localize our entire socioeconomic system. And if you just isolated that part, you'd be like, oh, this could slot into something Richard Heinberg might say, (laughs) but you come away going like, I, I was so painful to read this whole, whole talk. He, he, he's, it, you can read the damn thing. And it's like this rambling thing about how close we are to just dying off completely, all of us. But here's what you should be working on. <laughs> it just made absolutely no sense. It's so incoherent. It's completely incoherent. Total, total dissonance. I have there. no idea why he would ever talk to anybody about this. And if you're going to say all this, why... Why take any action? I don't know, man. But uh, whatever it is we're going to do, we better do it quick. (laughs) How would you like to hang out with a Cher, Rob, and Jason? Well, your chance is coming up at the fourth annual Crazy Town Hall. The Town Hall is our most fun event of the year, where you can ask questions, play games, get insider information on the podcast, and share plenty of laughs. It's a special online event for the most dedicated crazy townies, and it's coming up on June 6th, 2023, from 10 to 11.15 a.m. U.S. Pacific Time. To get an invite, make a donation of any size. Go to postcarbon.org slash support crazy town. When you make a donation, we'll email you an exclusive link to join the Crazy Town Hall. If we get enough donations, maybe we can finally hire some decent hosts. Join us at the Crazy Town Hall on June 6th, 
2023. Again, to get your invitation, go to postcarbon.org slash support crazy town. Okay, let's get into what species Guy McPherson is. It's pretty straightforward. The taxonomy is absolutely clear. You know, there's a whole section of the taxonomy that keys out to if you're trying to really hold the system together, you're really working hard. You know, these are the double downers and he's, all these he's, people. He's that, probably not going to land in that part of the, no. the taxonomy. So then you go to the other side of the taxonomy and it, it basically if you've kind of given up or you're trying to blow it up or whatever. And so the couplet here is fatalistic about near-term human extinction so it tries to have fun, and that's the species hospice hedonist, or the Latin is homo hospitatum hedonistico. Wow, good pronunciation that time. Thank I'm impressed. You. Basically, his, his message of this species to all other in the genus homo is not a happy one. The end is very near, and we are helpless to do anything about it. However, while telling everyone they and their children are about to die isn't fun, <laughs> they are stoic about the final days. Find joy in the moment and truly appreciate the little time we have left with our loved ones. Maybe even party hard. Wow. And, and, and this is actually an amazing quote I found because when you read his speeches, it, it is this really bizarre combination of sort of philosophizing about the end, <laughs> explaining to you why it's the end, but then also a lot of this sort of philosophy about how, how this creates meaning and we should find joy and this we can do all these wonderful things together. So here's an amazing quote. I'm often asked for advice about how to live during these tenuous times. In response, I recommend living fully. I recommend living with intention. I recommend living urgently with death in mind. I recommend the pursuit of excellence. I recommend the pursuit of love. In light of the short time remaining in your life and my own, I recommend all of the above louder than before, more fully than you can imagine. To the limits of this restrictive culture and beyond, live like you are dying. The day draws near. So we've made fun of Guy McPherson a fair bit about his predictions, the timing of those predictions. And based on the quote you just laid on us, Jason, and the taxonomy, I... We could make fun of him as someone who's clearly able to say a bunch of stuff without saying anything. Uh, what was that? Uh, I recommend pursuit of excellence. That's the Raiders football team. Their That's their slogan. slogan? They're yeah. pursuing excellence? <laughs> yeah. yeah. So I, I think he's just a Raider fan. Yeah, there it is. It's right in front of you. Excellence. Go get it. Yeah. Right. Uh, but there's a lot more to critique here. It's, it's actually the substance and the basis that he's basing all these predictions on. A lot of people have looked into his work. Multiple Earth scientists have scoured through McPherson's analysis, and they've found major issues with the sources that he uses, you know, relying on a lot of sort of gray literature and soft sources and the way he uses data, cherry picks, and also his interpretation of feedback loops. So one of these uh, folks that's looked at his work is a hydrogeologist named Scott Johnson, and he points out the danger in McPherson's approach where, you know, McPherson, he kind of claims to just be passing along yeah. scientific data. You know, mm -hmm. it's like, right. I, I'm just looking at the data. I'm looking at the science. I have the guts to tell you the truth. Yeah, that kind of thing. Yeah, and it, it makes it seem like all of his predictions have this weight of science behind them when, in fact, it's based largely on unscientific sources. Yeah. He often cites blog posts, news articles, and when when he does cite peer-reviewed journal articles, he picks pieces out of it, often misinterprets it, and and gets conclusions that are actually from news stories that were written about that journal article. Hmm. Yeah. So Scott Johnson summarizes the problem with, with McPherson in, in this, this quote very well. In many ways, McPherson is a photo negative of the self-proclaimed climate skeptics who reject the conclusions of climate science. He may be advocating the opposite conclusion, but he argues his case in the same way. The skeptics often quote snippets of science that, on full examination, doesn't actually support their claims. And this is McPherson's modus operandi. Okay, so if we say, look at this guy, the substance of his arguments are not grounded in solid scientific foundations or whatever, 
He's clearly he's, been off prediction. His predictions <laughs> are completely way off. Then why are we bothering talking about this guy? Yeah. Well, first of all, I think it, it stems from the fact that he's talking a lot about the same stuff we talk about. Yeah. But the way he goes about it and the way he's obviously sort of outlandish and making these statements about timing and severity, it makes us look look stupid in some ways. Like, <laughs> well, and look, we don't need anybody's help, help or no. outside no. help to make oh, us I know. look stupid. We don't stupid. want to outsource that. This no. is we, our job. We can make ourselves look dumber <laughs> than anyone, okay? Yeah. We, I hope you listeners are aware of, of how stupid... We don't we... need his help. Okay, well... Thank you, Rob. Thank you for clarifying. Well, so are we just being honest? A part of our thing here is like that there's a there's a real reaction and a frustration that we have yes. because this is like, you know, this is hit, hits close to home right. with a lot of the issues that we are concerned about and talk about. Yeah, right. You so know? talk it's about like our- you said, Asher, like he makes observations that we would agree with. And then, then, then he predicts we're all going to die tomorrow right, right after that. You know, it's like, no. Yeah. So there's been a history of backlash from folks that maybe don't want to hear these stories, don't want to hear these ideas, don't want to hear these critiques. And this, these backlash sort of empower denialists, right? Empower the, the status quo. I mean, the famous one, of course, was the Ehrlich-Simon bet, right? Paul Ehrlich of Stanford University, Julian Simon, sort of a business guy popularizing the idea that there are no limits. We've talked to him when we, we've it been past episodes. Yeah, so like Ehrlich's talking about there are limits based on population, based on consumption, ecology. And yep. then Simon's saying, no, there are no limits. Right. The human mind will solve all problems yes. and the more the merrier. And there's tr- trillions of years of growth in front of us. Right. Just absurd, absurd stuff. But Ehrlich made a bet and he lost. And of course, if Ehrlich had just like... Yeah, this was like to predict the future. Of, of the price of, of like, commodities. Yeah. And... He lost, and it's tar- sorry he lost. I mean, if the bet had been for ten years later or whatever, he might have won it. So it was again being too specific about timing, and 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 not understanding that the system is hard to understand exactly what's going to happen, right? So, well, can I just interject and say I, I think there's a there's a looking in the mirror as well for for all of us because mm-hmm. I think there's a tendency to want to have. Um, you know, people are looking for answers when you present them with a with a challenge, with a problem that we're facing. Right. And we've seen that in the in the sort of peak world community. I think we at, at Post Government Institute have encountered that a lot, which is people are like, "Give me some certainty. Tell me how things are going to happen. Right. You know, when is this going to happen? If you're talking about the economy no longer growing, do you right. know what I mean? Or we're going to hit issues with with peak oil production. You know, when is that going to happen? What that's going to people look like? People love and, that. And and it, you know, there's a tendency, a desire. I think we all want to have that certainty, but there's also you're sort of in a situation where you feel like pressed in a sense to give people that that right. certainty. And and I think that we've been guilty of that as well. It's an understandable tendency. Like I don't necessarily blame Ehrlich for having done it, but it's it can yeah. be a mistake. The more specific mistake. and the larger lesson gets lost. The larger right. argument, which is still fundamentally true, gets well, lost. Eric is right in the fundamentals. Yes, and, and so actually there's a whole species called the premature cassandulator in the taxonomy, which Ehrlich is a member of that species. And the idea is, is that, you know, Cassandra was actually right. Like the Cassandra Greek myth, Cassandra was right. Right. But if you prematurely cassandrulate, then people basically can can dismiss anything you say later, right? Or right. anything anyone else says when they're talking about the same thing. Right. right. And that's the problem here with McPherson. People lump him with climate scientists, even yeah. though he's not one. Yes. Yeah. And when his predictions inevitably uh, are off, yep. they're like, well, now you're all discredited. It's just a yeah. big hoax. This isn't something to worry about. It's a boy who cried wolf kind of problem. And, and but... There are real problems. There are problems with tipping points and feedback loops, and we should be thinking about that and knowing about that. But when he overstates this by such a degree, it leads to dismissal. Well, and yeah, and you think about it. You say we're all going to die in three years or in 18 months. You know, the planet's going to warm by the equivalent of five degrees C in yeah. a short period of time, and like that doesn't happen. And it's like, well, then maybe there's no warming happening. Or if we're not all going to go extinct, that means no one's going to die. I mean, we're obviously facing a situation where there's going to be a huge number of human and more than human lives lost as a result of climate change, right? Right. right. Well, let's look at another side of that. Like if you're somebody who happens upon McPherson's work and others like him 
you can get into this place of disempowerment right. where you know you kind of end up saying, oh, I have no agency. There's no point taking action. You, you get to this fatalist state. And there was a recent article in the Washington Post that talked about this 26-year-old engineer who became a climate doomer from reading that kind of stuff and watching YouTube videos. And there's a quote in there where this engineer says, it all compounded and just led me down a very dark path. I became very detached and felt like giving up on everything. So I think that's emblematic of the kind of toll on your mental health yeah. and on on the way it can paralyze you when you fall into this this doomerism trap. And we talked about scientists critiquing McPherson's work. There was another guy, Michael Tobis, who's an atmosphere and ocean scientist, and he's done some debunking of some of the the work that McPherson did, especially around the feedback loops and stuff. And and he had a quote that I think kind of summarizes this really well, or at least is kind of wondering, what's the point of this sort of fatalistic doomerism? And he, he says, why McPherson wants to scare the daylights out of people escapes me. It's not clear to me what his motivation is. I doubt he's in the employ of the Koch brothers, but he certainly demoralizes people who might otherwise have been active. So he's not doing us any favors. He may have more cultural affinity with environmentalists than with oil oligarchs, but he's doing them a lot more good than he's doing us. Yeah. Actually, I think this, you know, McPherson's obviously a, a, an extreme case, but there's a debate within the climate community really around this issue, which mm. is, you know, everyone's alarmed, right? But I would say some that are really anticipating the worst outcomes, even if they're not predicting, you know, near-term extinction right. of humans. But by right? the end of the century but, or whatever, yeah. You know, just really, really significant risks. And maybe they're taking some of the RCP models, you know, the the, the more sort of dire climate models to heart and, and, and saying that that's what our future is going to be. And others in the community who are also concerned, but what they're, what they're worried about is putting out such negative messages about, in a sense, the inevitable warming of the planet in the case of climate, that people are not going to act, right? right? So there's a lot of kind of like, I don't want to call it circular firing squad, but a lot of consternation and debate happening within the climate space. You know, Michael Michael Mann, who's a well-known climate scientist, has been quite outspoken on this, on the side of basically saying, you know, when you put out really dire predictions about the future, it basically is doing more service towards the fossil fuel interest, in fact, mm. than than supporting people to take climate action. I don't fully agree with that position at all. And I, in fact, it's something I think it would be worth worth talking about. But you could see that that is a debate. It's not just in, on the extreme edges like with a McPherson. Right, know? right. Yeah, okay. So this is something that I also think might happen is that as we go deeper into this unraveling of society to some extent, like we talk about the poly crisis, that more and more people are going to like try to find resolution in sort of one extreme or the other, right? And this is a challenge of, of, of where we are right now, where we sit, is holding kind of this dissonance like of not being sure and understanding the nuance and the uncertainty <laughs> and, and accepting that we do have some agency, that what we're trying to do is optimize for for better outcomes maybe not not the world that we wished we had <laughs> but a world that could be worse if we don't do something right right so how do you maintain this sort of sense of agency and there was actually a really recent article in the New York Times by Jerome Roos is that how we'd say it yeah um, R O O S a fellow at the London School of Economics and he says quote ours is clearly an age of upheaval Humanity now faces a confluence of challenges unlike any other in its history. Yeah, and, and the point that he's trying to make around this upheaval is that we need a new perspective to make sense of it. We've got these rapidly shifting conditions, and we need to view it with new eyes. But instead, and this is a quote from the article, he says, Instead, we're presented with two familiar but very different visions of the future. A doomsday narrative, which sees apocalypse everywhere, and a progress narrative, which maintains that this is the best of all possible worlds. Both views are equally forceful in their claims and equally misleading in their analysis. 
The truth is that none of us can really know where things are headed. The crisis of our times has blown the future right open. And I, I, I think he's really hitting the yes. nail on the head. We talked about this way back. I don't know if it's season one or season two, but like it's these two ends of the spectrum, apocalypse versus infinite yeah. progress. Neither one is right. Yeah. I, th- I think this has been a theme for us, consistent theme for us, not only in uh, in almost all the seasons of the podcast that we've done, but in the larger work that, that we at Post Carbon Institute do, which is trying to help people stay in that space of holding two truths simultaneously, in a sense, where in this case, there is a climate reckoning that's coming, that's inevitable. There's a reckoning of industrialization and a whole bunch of other issues that, that we're facing. It's not just climate, but in the mm-hmm. case of, of McPherson, we're talking about near-term climate extinction. So there is that. Even if we mobilize and did a tremendous amount of rapid mitigation and, and, and other strategies, there's there's a reckoning baked in the system. And yet, at the same time, it's not at this point runaway it doesn't lead to us all dying in three years. There is still agency. There's a lot that we could do, whether it's a softer landing, better outcomes, whatever goals you want to put out there. But you have to hold both of those things true at the same time. And I think people tend to revert to these sort of false narrative or simple narratives because it takes them out of that dissonance, right? It takes them out of that place of like that angst of feeling like I don't I don't know what to do. I have to face this. There's something I have to do. It's just easier in a sense. Fatalism and techno optimism to me are almost the same thing. Right. 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 They're the flip sides of the same coin. And it's interesting too because in that article he 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 actually used a word that that we've actually adopted as well at Post Government Institute, which is talking about living in a liminal space. You know the liminality, which is a term that is used to represent different things. Sometimes it's used to represent kind of like a coming of age moment. It could be you're on a threshold of a change and you're not really sure what is sort of in the next room or the next step forward. It's a moment of a lot of uncertainty and fear, but also a lot of possibility, right? Mm -hmm. And we know that this system that we built, even if we didn't have a climate crisis that was forcing us to change, has had a huge, tremendous cost on people, on, on nature, and other things. It has to change. And there's opportunity in that as well. One of the things I have to say that I'm concerned about, and one of the reasons I wanted to, to talk about McPherson, is that I do think as we get deeper into the teeth of this unraveling of social environmental systems, I think we're going to see more and more people who are going to step forward offering some kind of clarity and, and that's what McPherson's been doing. He's been offering people a clarity of basically we're all going to die and it's going to be tomorrow. Yeah. Um, other people are offering different forms of clarity. And maybe some of them are based on technology or they're based on something else, religious. The singularity. Singularity. <laughs> yeah. I, um, I'm glad to have this clarity, honestly. I, given that we're all going to be dead in 2020, so my, my daughter wanted to go to the World Cup soccer tournament, which is being held in the U.S. and Mexico in 2026. Well, I don't, yeah, I don't have to buy your tickets anymore. <laughs> <laughs> All right, here we go, folks. The insufferability index. Where does Guy McPherson land? How are you guys feeling about him? Remember, zero to 10. 10 is really bad. No one's gotten a 10 yet. <laughs> zero is awesome. No, we have no angels on the false prophet season. Surprise, surprise. All right, we're running through his their intentions, you know, from wonderful Mother Teresa type people to like evil doers, personality, quality of ideas, uh, and then, you know, scores bias. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Let me let me start, but a couple notes before I actually slap some numbers on the guy. On guy. <laughs> uh, first, He's kind of a complex person. Yeah. Uh, he seems to understand that we're in this severe predicament. He understands much of what's going on, but he seems so freaking susceptible to confirmation bias. Yeah. Right? And it just backs up his outlandish timelines for human extinction. But a, a cool thing about him is that he lives in an off-grid straw bale house where he practices organic gardening, he raises small animals for eggs and milk, and he works with members that, that live in his community. It's fascinating. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So 
just take these things into account. All right. But, I, I, okay, I say that. I've been so freaking mad. Uh, yeah, Just, like, too. going through yeah. his stuff. It's like... And I, it must be because that first thing I said, he understands so much. Right. And then takes away people's agency. It's so frustrating. You know, it is frustrating. Do you remember the episode that we did on, on the two oxen where there were these, basically these animal rights groups who went after this, this very progressive yeah. college? Because oh, yeah. they were, they not only were putting these two old oxen down that worked on the, on the farm at the school. But they actually serve them. Yeah, they're gonna eat them because it's like, what, what's more sustainable? And these guys than... went after them. I mean, they did right. denial of service on their website. They were like harassing them. They called all the basically the meat processors around, and it just them, yeah. it's like sometimes we get most mad at the ones that are closest to yeah. us. I think yeah. that's a proximity what's going on. thing. Maybe yeah. so, but yeah. okay. So let's let's put some numbers down. I think his intentions are, I want to say, pretty good. So I'm not gonna give him a big high score there. Maybe a one or so. Personality, uh, yeah, I don't know, one to two maybe. And then quality of ideas is where I'll probably ding him the most. So I think he's getting about a five from me. You get a mid-scale. Yeah. Even though I'm angry. I think I'm going to go a little higher. I think I'm going to give the guy a six. I think, I mean, this is the thing is how much of this intention is also about the power of you know being this special person who's the go-to guy for a near to human extinction mm-hmm. i i feel like there's a little there's so much ego there actually that it frustrates me i'm gonna go with you know but he's not like you're saying i'm i go with a six as well it's not over the top decision I've ever made in my entire life has been wrong. (laughs) My life is the complete opposite of everything I want it to be. If every instinct you have is wrong, then the opposite would have to be right. (laughs) Okay. Let's let's go about this by instead of saying doing the opposite, let's about thinking the opposite first. Okay. So how about avoiding the temptation to exaggerate and making your point or, or all this, you know, that, that sort of thing would be great not to do, not to, not to do. Yeah. I hope Guy is listening to this episode, <laughs> although he probably wouldn't have made it to this point. <laughs> yeah. Another way to think in an opposite way would be to watch out for confirmation bias. Again, you can go back in our catalog. We talked about problems with human behavior and confirmation bias is a big one where mm-hmm. we tend to Look for things out there that confirm already deeply held beliefs. Yeah, cognitive and, biases. We had a whole episode on that. Yeah, yeah. And part of that gets to kind of what you started talking about earlier, Jason, with the Ehrlich Simon bed is avoid overly specific predictions when you're analyzing, especially complex systems like this intersection between the human economy and the climate. You're just not going to get it right. Or if you do, you're probably pretty lucky. Right. Yeah. And then as we we talked about earlier, putting yourself in that liminal space of acceptance and agency, right? So it's accepting that we're we're entering into what we've been calling the great unraveling of post-carbon institute, you know, this unraveling of social environmental systems. So accepting that we're facing that, I cannot put the genie back in the bottle, but still feeling that we have agency, which we do. It, it's interesting that that article in the Washington Post, that young engineer says, quote, stop engaging excessively with negative climate change content online. Start engaging in your community. You could be one of those voices showing their support for the solutions. Now, we talk about having responses, not solutions, because we're faced with a predicament, yes. not a problem that we could easily solve. But but yes, I mean, I, I think it's easy to get into doom loop stuff, certainly online. So it's important to be aware and and to be cognizant of what's going on out there to understand the science of what we face in the case of climate and other things. But avoid falling into the, the trap of just scrolling all day long, reading bad news, and get out there and connect with people. And part of what I think helps people stay in a place of acceptance and agency is doing it with other people. So not feeling alone with that. I think it's a really, really key thing and very important for, for kind of emotional well-being as well. Yeah, kind of taking it from the realm of thinking to doing. We've got a friend of PCI, an advisor, actually, Peter Kalmus. You guys know the climate scientist. Mm -hmm. And 
I've interviewed him twice uh, as bonus episodes of Crazy Town, and he knows the situation is dire. He's scared for the future. He's scared for what kind of planet his children are, are inheriting. But he also knows that extinction is not tomorrow. And so he's out there taking action, taking real courageous action. He's Remember, he chained himself up to the J.P. Morgan in, in Los Angeles to mm-hmm. protest how much money they're investing into the fossil fuel industry. He's uh, handcuffed himself to a, the airport terminal for private jets, realizing that this is a luxury that we don't need to be spending fuel on. And so he... He's out there trying to make a difference, trying to raise awareness, but doing so not by fear mongering, but by protesting that which we we can't continue to do. Yeah. So I think taking action and whatever action that makes sense for you, that is congruent with ecological and pro-social values is always great. It's always a positive thing to do. And it's a powerful counter agent to the drumbeat of doomerism. And it's not just hopium, all right? This is. I hate that word. I know, I hate that word too. (laughs) McPherson doesn't like that word. He calls it hopium if you do something, quote unquote, hopeful. But I don't think he's right about near term extinction. So there are things we can do to create more benign outcomes. And that's what I think we should be working for. But do them fast within three years' time. Well, thanks for listening. If you made it this far, then maybe you actually like the show. Yeah, and maybe you even consider yourself a real inhabitant of Crazy Town. Someone like us, who we affectionately call a Crazy Towny. If that's the case, then there's one very simple thing you can do to help us out. Share the podcast, or even just this episode. Yeah, text three people you know who you think would get a kick out of hearing from us bozos. Or if you want to go way old school, then tell them about the podcast face-to-face. Please, for the love of God, if enough people listen to this podcast, maybe one day we can all escape from crazy town. We're just asking for three people, a little bit of sharing. We can do this. How does an ecologically aware human navigate the madness of high energy modernity and survive without going insane? How do you manage painful compromises without provoking crippling anxiety? Well, I'll tell you what I do. I medicate with an enabling dose of, oh, fuck it. Just the other day, I had to run into a Costco to fetch a case of diapers for a relative I was visiting. As I approached the store, a paralyzing tension struck, so I took out my bottle of fast fuck, (laughs) inserted it into my nostril, and released the mist. I soon had an out-of-body experience where I was positioned somewhere beyond the moon's orbit and could see the Earth as just a tiny planet in vast blackness speckled with stars. Diapers purchased in a warehouse of consumer hell became insignificant on the scale of the galaxy, and I was able to maintain good relations with my family. Fast fuck is great for a quick fix, but I understand long fuck has been helpful for you, Rob. Yeah, I got invited to be the best man at a destination wedding in Bali. So how how was I going to handle not only the knowledge of my flight, but that of the 120 other guests in our extravagant party on the other side of the planet? I needed something long acting, and long fuck, which comes in an easy to <laughs> Oh, I can't believe you gave me this copy, Jason. Uh, long fuck, which comes in an easy-to-swallow pill form, did the trick. Not once did I call out our collective hypocrisy or feel cognitive dissonance. I was attentive and charming, with a carefree and in-the-moment attitude. The only side effects were mild constipation and acne on my back. Well, that's great, Rob. I'm glad you had a good time in Bali. Ah, oh, fuck it. Available in fast and long fuck forms, giving you cosmic perspective and equanimity to live in crazy town. Crazy town. Da, 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 crazy town.